welcome to Chain Reaction. My name's Adam Buxton. Let me tell you about my guest this week, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to be here interviewing Reese Shearsmith. Reese originates from Hull and is a talented young writer and performer. <laughs> Having graduated from Bretton Hall Drama College with a BA, Hans. <laughs> In theatre arts, he is a quarter of the award-winning comedy team, The League of Gentlemen, and has appeared in a variety of television shows and films. He's also written and performed in London's Seafull Bio. <laughs> I was a little rushed this afternoon, so that's all I was able to copy and paste from IMDb. Um, to find out more, let's talk to Reese Shearsmith, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what were you writing and performing in London's... He has also written and performed in London's... London's... Um... <laughs> I don't know. The, it's like the uh, quiz element we're yeah. introducing here. Is there a right or wrong answer to it? There is a correct answer. Uh, well, West End stage? Nah, incorrect. What was it? Uh, the long-running weekly satirical show News Review. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, yes, if you want to go back that far. I don't actually remember that. Well, I don't think you were born. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, yeah, and that was a long, that's beyond... I can't quite remember it, but News Review is, is still around, and it's at the Canal Cafe, where we began as the League. It was a satirical sketch show, still yeah. goes on, and you do things like, Gordon Brown taxing our food. <laughs> yeah, songs like that, it's a little yeah. satirical, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, it's, just, it's better than that, but... Um... <laughs> This is around 94, 95? No, it? this is earlier. This is oh, really? 90. Having got your BA Hans from <laughs> Breton. Yes. yes, Breton Hall degree in drama, like having a degree in washing up <laughs> uh, a theatre arts course. What was the most technically challenging thing that you learned at Breton Hall that you felt, this is an actual skill and part of a craft that I have now mastered? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, 8.45 every morning at Breton Hall, there would be voice and movement. And I think it was the ability to widen the lower rib cage and open the diaphragm. Because one, one of the, the head, he's died now, but he was called John Hodgson, and he ran Breton Hall. And he was, he used to be Yiddish. And he said, three minutes of an actor. Addiction. Articulation. <laughs> and clarity of speech. <laughs> There's diction, articulation, and clarity of speech. And he said it like that, in that, in that way. And uh, he taught us voice and movement. Your body is your body is your violin. And he did this whole thing. He did it for every new set of drama people. He had a broken violin, and he had a, a brilliant new violin. He said, this is your body now. And this is your body's ease. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is your body in three years, translated. So, and, uh, and then he died during it, so I didn't... My body's still the first violin, I think. <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't really do very much at Breton. The good thing about Breton when we were there was that they left you to your own devices, really. And Steve and Mark were doing... Mark Gatiss and Steve Pemberton were in the year above me doing really funny things on their own, in their own time, and I kind of emulated them and wanted to be like them. And they laughed at me when I arrived, because my full name is Reeson, which is son of Reese. And there was a group picture of the new set of first years... And I was sat as if I was a little toff, and they found this picture and said, who's this recent Shearsmith? <laughs> ew, ew. And they thought I was a, a fun thing, that little Lord Fauntleroy-type character. You've even got a, you've got a middle name as well, though, right? It's Wayne. Reeson Wayne Shearsmith. My name was going to be John Wayne. Was it? <laughs> and my dad liked John Wayne. It's as stupid as that. And yeah. then he changed it to son of Reese. Your mum presumably argued him out of John Wayne. I think so. I'm glad. I hate... I don't like John Wayne. He was, um, yes, yeah, some people felt that he was a little bit of a right-wing creep. <laughs> it wasn't because of that, I just don't like the films. Yeah. I don't like westerns, so I would not have been saddled with it, quite literally, and I wouldn't <laughs> want that. So I'm glad I'm called Reese and Wayne. <laughs> now, we were making TV programmes around the same time <laughs> in the late 90s. Yeah. Your first series of The League of Gentlemen was on Radio 4 in 97. Yes, this Recorded. very stage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
quite literally, yeah. This is the first time you've been back since recording those it radio is. shows? It is, not had anything to do with them since. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We were making programmes uh, around the same time, like 99. Uh, Joe and I were doing, I think, the second series of our um, tremendous world-conquering Channel 4 show, The Adam and Joe Show. Yeah, you were, I very much remember you already being on as a thing on television when we were doing League. 1998, we filmed the first League of Gentlemen. Yeah. 99, it was on. Right. And I hadn't seen it when it went out on broadcast television. Right. So I was so busy waggling toys with coat hangers in them yeah um but we went to la me and joe to film some bits for our show and on the plane the league of gentlemen was on the comedy channel so i thought oh i've heard of this everyone's saying this is good i'll see i bet it's not that great <laughs> and i was struck by three things thing one and these are all sincere things by the way so things are going to get a little uncomfortable for a while <laughs> i was struck by how funny it was I laughed out loud at, um, we didn't burn him! Um, thing two, I was struck... I'm not interrupting any of this, I'm just letting you do it. Okay, yeah. you can interrupt if you disagree. No, no, I'm not, so I angry. agree. Thing two, I was... <laughs> <laughs> I was struck by how good the acting was. Ah, oh, very was a, kind. There yes, was a... finally someone says it. Yeah. <laughs> That's been noted before, yeah, surely. Yeah, well, not enough for There my was life. a total... <laughs> I'm, I'm now reading from notes I've made because I would not be able to be this articulate off the cuff, but there was a total commitment to the characters that made them more than just grotesques <laughs> and enabled them to interact with other quite naturalistic characters in a way that I hadn't seen before on a comedy show. Right, yes. And thing three was the attention to detail. But it had all been put together w with so much care and craft that you'd normally associate with a far more expensive TV production or a feature film. And that was something I felt I hadn't seen in a comedy well, show before. Yeah, that's interesting, because I think we did think... We didn't think there's a way of doing comedy that's never been filmed before. We just wanted to make it... Film it. We did have a lot of our, um, kind of, uh, the appeal of what we wanted to do. Because it was started on stage, and then we'd done the radio here, quite literally here. And then we thought, well, now we've got this opportunity to do a film version of it on TV. What do we... How do we do it? Do we do it like we did the live show, which was in tuxedos? It's like three of a kind? with all three of us with white background and, and very minimal props. And I, I could never conceive that Steve would do Pauline not in front of a live audience. That was always such a, a thrilling thing for him to work the audience and um, have them there and respond to it. Some of the best things we ever did was always the live stuff because we would mine and eke out and dig the knife in into the awful excruciating moments and then let everyone off the hook in the room with a laugh. And that was always very powerful and worked really well and I thought how can we get that on how do you do that it's a very puzzling thing to try and achieve and there's only three of us and will it become boring if we have all these character makeups and will it not we just not buy it and there was a lot of things that just now seem like nothing watching it but at the time there were big choices to make but uh, yeah the um, director was great Bendelak Steve Bendelak really got our references and you know where other comedy groups would or comedy would not have a wide shot of a car or a train going across a, a countryside because there's no joke in it we kept it we kept some air in it and that's the thing that always goes instantly it's like you know there's a great bit in the um monty python the holy grail commentaries and it's fascinating to listen to their different opinions of what matters you know gilliam's talking about the brilliant landscapes and then cleese comes on and goes look at that not a laugh in it <laughs> and it's just that's the difference and that's and i think we were erring on trying to give it some space and give it that filmic quality where things breathe a bit more it's everything everything does it now you know this the drama in comedy is the, is high these days and i think we've always strove striven is it strove or striven struve struve <laughs> to have those elements i don't think it's working unless there's a, a heightened moment of drama I mean, we shoot ourselves in the foot because often it, it can nearly be funny and then we do something horrible and spoil it. But that's what we've always done, I think. Well, we'll talk more about that later. Yes, we will. <laughs> I first got to know you guys a little better. When I say you guys, I mean you and Steve, Mark and Jeremy Dyson. When uh, you kindly asked me to come and shoot some behind-the-scenes footage for your third series Ugh, when you were doing big that. Big mistake. <laughs> Not because of you, but because of the whole element of bringing cameras into that process, yeah. you know. Oh, we so did you're it. serious? 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should never have filmed it. It was just... Um, why? why? Why do you feel weird about it now? It was never the same writing something with a camera on it. The camera would be turned off and then you could actually do it properly. So this was... The, uh, because half of it was stuff that you had shot yourselves, you were doing, like, video diaries. In the, yes, in it was all done, orchestrated, because Steve Pemberton wanted a video camera. And he said, if we say we're going to do a documentary about the video, we'll get free video cameras. <laughs> that was what it was. And then we did, and, we, and he, he literally just today told me, here we are, 25 years later, whatever it is, that he sold it on eBay for £405. <laughs> <laughs> he said you can't. He said you can't even really use it. All the plugins are all wrong. It's, you can't. I said, well, who have you sold it to? He said, oh, just some fan that wants a bit of kit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and the price sounds... you paid was non-stop intrusion throughout the yeah. Well, process. it didn't help the process of writing because you felt like you were performing. Yeah. How can you act? I mean, I have a big thing about this. Increasingly encroaching on the rehearsal process when you do plays and they want to film a bit of the rehearsal and it's like well can we do it get it right first it's like filming the magic trick to me it didn't all have to be a mystery but let me get a little bit part way in before you start just give everyone wants so much of you and of it and of the process and it's like yeah but people will be interested and i don't know if it's helpful you know it's funny but you i mean you you as a fan are someone who watches these things right you listen to the dvd commentaries uh, um, yeah, you're interested in the behind yeah, the scenes i do a little bit yeah increasingly i'm not bothered but I, it's hard to do a good commentary we've always been very candid in ours and that's probably what's appealing about them because i do i just genuinely often try to speak the truth you know i don't, I don't try to couch it and I, I'm a little bit less in real life as grumpy as it, the persona of me appears to be. Mm -hmm. But I am still quite angry and annoyed at a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, and that comes across in the work. But it's only because I'm trying to do the best work, yeah. you know. Well, that uh, leads me on quite neatly to asking you to what degree you are similar to some of your characters. Because <laughs> they're quite extreme characters. <laughs> I would imagine that it's a question you get asked a lot, like whether you're in any way like your characters. Well, Obviously, I don't yeah. think you're exactly the same. I don't think you're Papa Lazaru, but where do... I am. Where... <laughs> but that voice has to come from somewhere. I am conscious of playing a lot of angry... I like disproportionate anger. I think it's very funny. It's lovely to be able to play pent-up rage and then outbursts of surprising, vengeful kind of outbursts. And I don't know why that appeals to me. I have always played those parts in the league. Someone once very quickly analysed the league's formula and it was just three people in a room, one of them goes mad. And it, was all, and, and it, it kind of applies to all our scenarios, weirdly. But, and I often was the one going mad. But, um, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's not particularly that I'm angry in real life. I'm not. I'm, I'm much more placid now than I think I was. But, yes, the genius is in finding these characters and then placing them in situations where they are funny because, you know, there's a lot of... A lot of those characters might be quite tragic in certain real-life situations. Yeah. But uh, there's uh, Dean Tavaluras in the third series. Oh, yeah. Well, that was magician. quite underused, actually. Yeah, we didn't do much with Dean. I think, weirdly, we, I was talking to Jeremy about it, Dyson, about the cruelty in that sketch where he's in a coffee shop and he's trying to do some tricks to these girls. We kind of wanted the kind of scary girls that you get on the top of the bus where you just think, oh, please don't stab me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he dares to do a trick to them and uh, they... Obviously, it's awful, and their friends come and they just spoil it for him and say, what's in your hand, mate? What's in your hand? Open your hand up! And they see that he's got a thumb tip in his hand. It's that thing that me and Jeremy both felt as amateur magicians when we were little of someone just spoiling it for you, an uncle that won't go along with it, you know, cruel. And then they'd get, we went to the nth degree and they burnt his hand with a cigarette, and it was really horrible, and I think, um, I think it was too much, actually. And we were talking about how it was kind of just... it was we tipped over the edge in what we were trying to do. It wasn't quite us. Uh, it feel, it's a, left a bad taste in the mouth. Where I think a lot of the things we do are, you know, I'm, I don't like it if people just jump to the conclusion that we're trying to do gross-out, scary things. I think we always really have considered. And hopefully it's why it works and it's powerful because we're careful with it. And that, I think, was too much. And is that, is that something you felt was too much after it had been filmed and when you were watching it all edited? It's or? kind of no now. Now, Only right. now, maybe I'm old and I'm like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Cruelty. <laughs> and I'm just kind of getting a bit more squeamish in my old age. But I do look back and think, oh, it's actually not. It's horrible. There's no joke to it. It's just cruelty. So here's a very third-rate question. What is it then that you are doing when you... <laughs> what are you doing then? What the hell are you doing? 
<laughs> what do you think you're doing? <laughs> but when you add these very cruel moments, and I mean, cru- sometimes I mean cruel in the sense of one human being cruel to another deliberately, and then there are many moments that are just fate and life being cruel to a character. You know, it feels like you could often have quite a sweet, funny scenario that was still quite weird, but then it sometimes seems that you feel you have to add some other element which is really very sad or cruel or shocking. Yeah. Why do you think that happens? I think that is partly to do with the dissatisfaction of how the scene feels if that element isn't there. Steve and I have often tried to write things that are lighter in tone, and it's missing something if it hasn't got someone being killed in it, (laughs) or a high drama element where it's actually, you know, the stakes are high and there's, there's a great peril, and it plays out like something that just makes you sit up watching television. All we really try and do is write things that... If you started watching it, you couldn't not watch it till the end, and it would not take you where you expected. So, and it's born out of that. We just, I feel, it's always lacking something if it's not got. Um, like, for instance, an exact example of this is the sardines episode of Inside Number Nine, which was that was the first a, one, a first episode, yeah. And it was a game of sardines, which is this funny parlor game where you hide, and then if you find the person, you stay with them, and slowly but surely, everyone that's playing the game ends up trapped together like sardines and um it was a funny idea and we thought of it because we write in an office in muswell hill and there's a big wardrobe in the office and i just looked one day and we thought what about a game of sardines and literally began from there we wrote it with that idea funny every few minutes a new character coming in till we got 12 people in a box (laughs) without the child abuse and then we thought (laughs) right this is the child abuse that appeared in the episode. You're not just sort of suggesting that there's always <laughs> child abuse when anyone plays sardines. In the episode, yeah. So we, then we thought, actually, what if there's some other thing, there's some other dread that's just rumbling under everything, and it suddenly came alive and it felt like that's the thing, that's the missing element. And it would have been a perfectly acceptable, fine comedy without the thing, but it was so much better when it had that extra element and that reveal at the end that had the brilliant Tim Key doing this fantastic performance in it that elevated our writing to something else, you know. So uh, it, was, it was a really great thing to think of that and add it in. But that's that thing that I'm talking about where it doesn't feel ready or finished until we've injected a, a big element of drama. That's what I think we do. And it's yet, not just I've... comedy. I mean, you do... I I sometimes get the feeling from you that you wish some of your stuff would cross over more than you think it has. And I would suggest to you that partly that might be to do with people getting cancer and child abuse stuff coming out. (laughs) What what about that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you're right. I... On the one hand, I want my cake and be able to eat it, don't I? Because I wish more people would have seen number nines... They did pretty well, I thought. Oh, I don't know. Did they, Adam? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, they did all right. I mean, maybe it's telly. People have different ways of watching television these days, don't they? They don't watch it like Malcolm and Wise anymore. They the, mainline it. It's the new way of watching it. TV, not watching it. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do think those were, for us, quite accessible. Yeah. I mean, the one we did that was um, mostly silent which was a kind of an exercise, again, in, just, in um, could we do it? We began writing one that was a... We thought it's like a heist, and we could we get, like, ten minutes of them having to be quiet? And, and there was no talking throughout the episode. And then in the end, we wrote it, we managed to get 28 pages of stage direction, and we did the whole thing silent, yeah. yeah. Not kind of a pastiche of silent comedy, because we couldn't speak because we were robbing the house. So there was a reason why we had to be quiet. And that, that was good and successful, but it was like Chuckle Brothers. <laughs> Yeah, it was quite. It was Steve and I just doing Lauren Hardy. I mean, it got a little bit horrible at the end, but generally there was a lot of stuff you could have shown ten-year-old. It, I mean, they were, this is a spoiler, but you violently stabbed a dog halfway through <laughs> with, a, with an umbrella. With an umbrella, yeah. <laughs> you, the dog fell into a hat stand thing, and you stabbed it. <laughs> I know, but it was funny. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's true, we do. But then that's that thing. I want to kind of elevate it into not being just the nuts and bolts of comedy. Hopefully. I mean, we are always 
trying to not do the same thing. Um, and league-wise, sorry, but I'm contractually obliged to ask, um, is the door still open for more League of Gentlemen-style activity with the four of you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we had a break 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, we thought we would do something. I think we would definitely want to do something. We're not, not friends. I think we're meeting next month to talk about a thing that might eventually be our next thing. Be well, exciting. you've all become so ludicrously successful in your own right. It must be difficult to coordinate time-wise. That's all it is, yeah. And it's just going, right, well, we're going to do a thing, but we have to say, you stop doing that, you stop doing that, and we start doing this yeah. from this time onwards, yeah. So hopefully it will happen. I'm not sure that it will be Royston Vasey. I don't know if anyone could bear that it was that again. But it certainly would be a League of Gentlemen project, which is me and Mark and Stephen, Jeremy under the umbrella of the League, which has never left us. We'll never leave, as, as, we, as we said. <laughs> we focused on your work with Steve and with the rest of the League throughout yeah. most of this chat. I mean, I, I was interested to know if you have an idea of a, a, a career that you would like to have if you didn't have your own? Like, what would your sort of ideal situation, fantasy situation be? Um, well, I've, I always regret not doing as much as I could have done with my art. I was always going to do something with drawing and um, caricatures. That or makeup and special effects. I did have a little foray in, into that. When I was young, I started a dialogue with Christopher Tucker, who did the makeup for The Elephant Man, and lots of Burmese films at the time. And then out of the blue, he said, do you want to come and uh, work with me? apprenticeship but I went because I thought I can't not it's an incredible opportunity and I worked with him in this big mansion house in Pangbourne with the elephant man's head and Gregory Peck's head in my bedroom from the boys from Brazil with a neck ripped out for about two months and I thought what am I doing it was like Jonathan Harker in Castle Dracula no kind of talking about what the arrangement was. Yeah. I was just getting up, slush moulding the head of um, Michael Crawford for all the West End productions of Phantom of the Opera and thinking, this is insane. And I crept away in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> just terrifying. And he, he doesn't, I've never spoke to him since. He must think, what happened to him? <laughs> I just thought, I can't, this is just too weird, isn't it? Is there a fee? Am I being paid? I'm being <laughs> slid my food under the door. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a curious time. And, um, and I've kind of managed to keep one foot in that and yeah. my drawings, because I draw a lot of the characters and sketches and stuff for the conceiving of the characters. That we, I've drawn things, and they've ended up in script books and things. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about the, the legacy of a lot of your work thus far. Um, that was a little fart noise for my question rather than for your work thus right. far. <laughs> which I have nothing but genuine respect and enthusiasm for. Uh, a lot of your stuff's been very influential, I think, certainly in the comedy world. Like, it's influenced the way people go about shooting their shows and the way they look and the kind of performances. I mean, I feel that some of the voices that you do, the Pam Douve and uh, Mr. Jelly and... Uh, Papa Lazarou have got so deep into my head and I enjoy the sound of them so much that I feel them coming out sometimes when I'm doing silly voices and things that I've done before. Do you feel like you're noticing the influence in other people's work? And, and if so, how does that make you feel? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I genuinely, I think we are a little Oxbow Lake caveat on the side of the Hulk of comedy. I don't, I don't see it at all. I mean, I'm obviously the wrong person to even talk to about it because I don't see any I think we did our thing and it kind of passed people by I did this thing in December last year at the Royal Free some sketches from the league and we three were back on stage and Jeremy was in the audience and there were some big people there was um, Harry Hill and um, Rowan Atkinson was on I presume they were going to be at the other end headlining and they said oh no you're last you're on at the end and I was like I wanted to go to bed at half nine I thought I'd be back home I'd be the first half and that would be it but we they kept us back like we were a thing and it was genuinely surprising to me that a anyone knew it and b that it was enough of a thing that they'd make it like oh it's, a, it's an event I find it odd because I, I lived through it and to me it never reached the heights of people knowing it. Obviously, people like you liked it, and I think a certain element of people loved it. What do you, what do you mean? 
<laughs> you mean people like me? Because you've got good taste. <laughs> and this is why I'm sat here as yes. your choice. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I don't know. I, I uh, <laughs> don't watch much comedy. I can't bear it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that might be why I don't see the influence. <laughs> I'd love the idea that people remember it and they take things from it. Yeah. Like Elder Statesman, but I'm not sure that it's uh, quite revered like that. Uh, I'm getting this image of you now. There's a scene in Psychoville where Mr. Jelly is standing at the back of a gym watching uh, his rival, Mr. Jolly, is he? Yeah. Yep. Um, doing a Punch and Judy not show. Real sausages! <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have up Mr. Jelly, you'd have got real sausages! <laughs> Yes, I do. I just that sort scene. of imagine you with your comedy rivals <laughs> sh- sh- shouting a version of "They're not real sausages." <laughs> Have you ever watched yeah. an award show and shouted abuse at comedians you dislike <laughs> when they receive an award? Yes, yes, I have done that. Yeah, I mean, I, I often think that there are award programs and something wins an award that you don't agree with, and it robs the the bauble of its currency. You know, and you do think, well, that's. If I get one of them, I wouldn't want it now. But of course you do. And you would want always to be recognised. It's lovely when you do get nominated for things because you think someone's seen it. It's a leaky bucket, though. It's never enough. Right, exactly. And that's, that's the problem. It that's... drives you mad if you think there's a level of... And I'm all right now. You know, you mustn't think it. you just got to keep thinking, well... Some people like it. If I can bear to keep doing it, I will. And that's my life. <laughs> No, I'm very, I mean, I every day genuinely sit and uh, smile to myself that I'm doing what I do. You know, I, I, we, Mark and I play a game of how it would be if you were sent back in time to 1992 again and had to, to <laughs> and had to do it again, trying to make all the connections and just happy accidents that occurred for us to get on and get through the door. And it'd be impossible, I think, to do it. You know, it's such a, a lucky thing that we're allowed to do it because it is like you said earlier it's a niche an odd strong flavor what we do but there's room for it and i'm glad that we, we keep occupying it now as i say your voices are very much deep within my soul now for better or worse and a lot of other people's too and i'm always excited and interested to see what you do next thank you so much for coming You're along welcome. and talking to me i really appreciate it thank you adam reese shearsmith ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 